What's up, guys? How we doing tonight? Well, <laughs> well I'm really happy to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, my name is Trayvon Graves, and I get the opportunity to serve as the college ministry intern this year. First and foremost, I just want to thank Autumn and the VISTA as a whole for giving me the opportunity to serve in this capacity. It's been a huge blessing for my life and my walk with Jesus. And I'm just so excited to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, I'm currently, a little bit about me, I'm currently in my senior year at UMHB. I'm studying computer information systems. I'm a computer nerd, but I also have a minor in Christian studies. Uh, recently just picked that up because this internship has may uh, help me realize that I have a calling to ministry and I just want to be faithful to that and follow that. So that's why I'm really excited to be able to be speaking with you guys tonight. Well, with all that being said, um, if this is your first time here at Vespers, first and foremost, we just want to say welcome. We're excited that all of you guys are here with us tonight. I know school, we're at that point of the semester where these teachers are tripping when it comes to homework, projects, and exams, honestly. So I just want to just say thank you guys for being here. And secondly, we are currently in our ninth week of our series, The Deep End, which has just been a series where we're reading through the Gospel of Mark and seeing how we can dive deeper into our faith and relationship with Jesus. Being a senior, I've realized that over my time in college, there has been times where I've had to reflect and understand areas where I struggle with keeping God's commands. There's also been areas where I've had to reflect and understand when I have been that stumbling block for others around me. And I know I'm not alone in that. There are things that we all struggle with and there are times where we can be that stumbling block for others around us. And that's why when me and Autumn were talking at the beginning of the semester of where I would come from this semester for my time to preach, I chose Mark chapter nine. And that's where we're gonna be at tonight. We're gonna to be in Mark chapter nine, starting at verse 38. Um, we're gonna start at verse 38. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there now or it'll be on a screen for you to follow along. Just give us a little bit of time to get there. And yeah, okay, so Mark, 30, uh, Mark chapter nine, verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Don't stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything about, bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. So that was Mark chapter 9, verse 38 through 42. For a little bit of context, because this is a pretty heavy text from uh, a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. Before this conversation, the mindset of the disciples were in a place of arguing. They were arguing among themselves of who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The disciples had this sense of pride growing in their hearts and felt exalted because they were personally chosen to be Jesus' followers. They had this pride growing because, I don't know about y'all, but if I was chosen by the Messiah to follow him, I feel pretty good about myself. And that what was going on in their hearts. And this sense of pride and exaltation that they felt gave them the sense um, of feeling that they were the only ones who were authorized to proclaim Jesus to perform miracles. In this case, casting out demons. Yeah, this is ironic because the disciples had previously failed in their attempts to cast out demons and perform other miracles because of their lack of faith. Yet they didn't hesitate to stop someone just because he wasn't a member of their team. We see here that Jesus warns them of a couple things. The first thing that we're gonna look at tonight is causing others to stumble. Jesus starts off by telling them, stop. Why, like, why are you stopping him? Don't do this. 
Secondly, he says something that's important to us. Whoever is not against them is for them. What does this mean? Whoever is not against us is for us. Well, this saying and this, you know, terminology used by Jesus is more practical than it is theological. Um, on the screen real quick, we're going to look at Mark chapter 3, verse 22 through 26 to kind of get a better understanding of what Jesus is saying right here. And it reads, And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Here we see the scribes come to Jesus with accusations. They come accusing him of using demonic powers to fight evil. And Jesus points out, that's dumb. Like, why would Jesus use evil powers to fight evil powers? Because if he would do that, that would cause the kingdom of darkness to fall which ties back to this conversation that he's having with his disciples. Them stopping someone who is choosing to fight alongside the Messiah, who's choosing to fight against the kingdom of darkness, all because he wasn't a part of their group, was doing more harm to the kingdom than good. And what we can take from that is that causing others to stumble is equivalent to causing division in the kingdom of God. Causing others to stumble is equivalent to causing division in the kingdom of God. And a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus is very clear on how seriously he takes Christians causing other Christians, disciples causing other disciples to fall away from his glory. By saying that it is better to have a millstone tied around their neck and being thrown into the sea. I don't know about y'all, but that sounds scary. I personally wouldn't want to be in that position. And just for visual purposes, I just want to show you guys like a picture of a millstone. This is what Jesus is talking about. Imagine having that tied around your neck and getting thrown into Belton Lake. Like that's not a good, that's not like a position that I would want to be in. And you know, now that we know the consequences for causing others to stumble, let's look at, you know, what that looks like to us. And to do that, we're going to look at Romans 14, starting in verse 15, and we're going to go through verse 21. Romans 14, 15 through 21. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. What does this mean? Well, for context, Paul is writing to the Roman church about their freedom in terms of eating food that is traditionally seen as clean or unclean. The Roman church was a Gentile church, and they struggled with, you know, commu uh, having community with the Jewish church because, you know, they like pork, they like bacon, I like bacon, and the Jewish people saw that as wrong. So Paul was saying, why are, 
you know, we fighting about this, we should be doing everything that leads to peace and mutual edification. And that's what I highlighted. Paul is saying, let us make every effort to do at least a peace and mutual edification. What does this word edification mean? The word edification refers to the process of spiritual growth in a disciple who is living according to the will of God. The process of spiritual growth in a disciple who is living according to the will of God. The main gist of this scripture is that with freedom comes responsibility. There are things that we might not find sinful, but can be harmful to those around us. I'll give a quick example. Alcohol is not inherently evil. Some of us can enjoy, you know, a nice margarita or, you know, a little martini without breaking the command of staying sober-minded. If I were to go out to dinner or lunch with some friends, and I have a friend that struggles, struggles with alcoholism or doesn't have the self-control to limit their drinking, would it be right for me to get a pineapple margarita with salt on the rim and a lime on top just because I don't share that same struggle? Of course not. We are supposed to lift each other up, not be the reason each other fall. You may not find anything wrong with how you dress, but the Bible and God gives us the instruction to be mindful of what we wear because that can cause one of our brothers or sisters to fall into lust. And that command goes for both men and women. And I often hear, well, why am I responsible for somebody else's struggles? Simple. Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. You may know that we have freedom in and through Christ. Good. But that's not the case for everybody. Some people don't have the knowledge that you have. There may be things that they still find sinful, or there may be areas in their life where they're just simply struggling and keeping God's commands. And that can be hard. That can, you know, that can truly be hard for us to grasp that we are our brothers and sisters keepers. We are the body of Christ. We are the church, and we are all members of the kingdom of God, and a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So that's all I have for you guys for the first bit of teaching time, and we're going to break off into our first bit of discussion questions. I have the questions up on the screen for you guys, so let's just take some time answer these questions and talk about it amongst yourselves at the tables. We'll be back in a little bit. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to get started. So as mentioned earlier, cool. All right. As mentioned earlier, the, um, Jesus had this conversation with his disciples. The first thing that we looked at was causing others to stumble. And Jesus then flips the script on his conversation with them, telling his disciples to recognize things in their lives that cause them to stumble. So we went from seeing how we cause others to stumble to start understanding areas in our lives that cause us to stumble and then taking those steps to cut those things out of our lives. So we're going to pick back up in Mark chapter 9, and we're going to start at verse 43. And we're going to finish out through verse 48. If you guys want to flip there or it'll be on the screen for us to follow along. So verse 43 picks up and says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eyes cause you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Huh. I understand that that is heavy and 
it's all going to make sense by the end of this. I am not a hellfire and brimstone type of preacher, so I'm not going to be, you know, trying to scare tactic you guys into not sinning. But what we are going to be talking about, like I said, is that we need to recognize the things in our life that is causing us to stumble and cutting those out. In these verses, Jesus uses an extreme metaphor to convey his message to his followers. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, etc. For it is better to enter life with missing limbs than to be eternally separated from God. This would have been a radical teaching in their time because self-mutilation was seen as forbidden in Jewish culture and um, doctrine. And that, you know, brings up the question, why? Why does Jesus use this extreme terminology? Simply put, he's driving home the severity of sin. He isn't being literal when he's saying to cut off your feet and your hands. But what he's saying is that it's better to be crippled, it's better to be maimed than to be spiritually dead and to risk your eternal separation from God. It's not news to us that we all struggle under the power of sin. Romans 3, 3 and 9 tells us that we are all under the power of sin. And a couple of weeks ago, Autumn had us recite Romans 8, chapter 1. Therefore, that was, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is true. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who paid the price for our sins. But this, is not, this does not mean that we can just continue to willingly indulge in our sin. Because doing so is an abuse of God's grace. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 tells us, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Two key words. We have died to sin. And he asked the question, how can we live in it any longer? That's what separates Jesus' disciples from the world and from his disciples. People who are living in the world continue to live in their sin. They are, walk, they are walking around living, but they're spiritually dead on the inside. We as disciples are called to be dead to sin. We're called to be, crucify our flesh, to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Autumn told us that last week. What Jesus is teaching his disciples is that, and what we can learn from this, is that we need to cut out the things in our life that cause us to fall into habitual sin. We need to cut out the things in our lives that cause us to fall into habitual sin. Habitual sin is the practice of sinning continuously with no conviction, remorse, or resistance. Habitual sin is the practice of sinning continuously with no conviction, remorse, or resistance. You don't feel bad for your sin. You don't try to fight against that temptation. That's what habitual sin is. There are things that the enemy will use to entice us to falling short of God's glory. And if we don't recognize that, that could be detrimental to our faith. So for this second part, I really want to devote time looking at steps that we can take to cut out some things that are causing us to fall into habitual sin. The first is understanding that the enemy uses our own fleshly desires to tempt us. Two is recognizing the areas where you are weak. And three, cut, cutting out the triggers that lead us into temptation. Understanding that the enemy uses our own fleshly desires to tempt us, recognizing the areas where we are weak, and cutting out triggers that lead us into temptation. When it comes to the enemy, he always tempts us with what he knows our flesh desires. I love sports. I used to play football and basketball when I was in high school, so I'm gonna use a quick sports analogy that should paint the picture pretty well. Even, uh, you know, I know I have some athletes in here, so let's um, go ahead and paint this uh, analogy real quick. When I played sports a while back, 
um, before we got ready for a game, we will watch film on the other team. We will watch film, that way we can you know, watch their tendencies, their strengths, and their weaknesses. That way on game day, we can remember those strengths and those weaknesses, but most importantly, we will try to exploit those weaknesses that we had analyzed during our time studying their film. That way we can give ourselves leverage over them and put ourselves in a position to win. The enemy does the exact same thing with us. He analyzes our every move. He analyzes our strengths. He analyzes our tendencies. He analyzes our weaknesses. The Bible describes the devil as a roaring lion seeking for whom he may devour. Growing up, I was a National Geographic kid. You will always catch me in front of the TV watching Shark Week and watching Animal Planet, seeing all the giraffes and stuff on the safari desert and stuff. And one thing that I noticed about a lion is that when a lion hunts, he just creeps in the grass, looking at the pretty gazelle running on a field, and he will always just stalk them, trying to look for the weakest gazelle to attack so he can get some easy dinner. And that's how the devil works. He follows us, he watches us to see how he can get us to fall short of God's, God's glory. All in effort so he can gain leverage over us and make us fall short of God's glory. If your weakness is lust, he'll tempt you with what you're attracted to. If your weakness is gossiping, he'll make sure that the tea is too hot not to spill. Whatever the case may be, he will use your weakness against you. This is why Paul tells us that it is important to keep on the full armor of God. That way, when the enemy brings his little sneaky attacks and tries to attack us, we can be on guard, stand ten toes, and resist his tactics, resist his tricks, and resist that temptation. I have a weakness in understanding my identity in Christ. So the devil will often use tactics such as self-doubt, lies from the enemy to get in my head and make me overthink my, you know, validity in my relationship with Jesus. He often tells me, you're not worth it. You're not, you know, how can Jesus love someone who lived the life that you live, who made those mistakes that you made, who continues to fall even though you know what is right from wrong. He uses our weaknesses to get into our head and make us fall short of God's glory, to make us believe that we are too far gone. Good news for us, we're not too far gone because Jesus loves us so much that he died for those sins that we continue to struggle with. We must recognize the things that trigger us. Maybe that's being alone in the apartment or the, um, you know, being alone in a private setting with your girlfriend or boyfriend. Or maybe that's the music that you listen to. Maybe it's the movies that you watch. Maybe it's social media. Whatever the case may be, we need to recognize the things that trigger us. Because if we don't recognize the triggers, we will continue to be stuck in a continuous sin loop. A continuous sin cycle that is doing damage to your spirit. When the devil finds a method, he will continue to spam that method and use it against us over and over and over again until we figure out how to break that. And how to break that is to seek God, to seek the Spirit and ask help from the Holy Spirit to lead you out of that temptation. That's why it's important to recognize the things that lead you into that temptation. Recognizing these things are good. But what's next after that? Luckily for us, Jesus gave us that answer. Cut off your hands and your feet if they leave you into sin. What does this look like? If you're someone who struggles with lust, that may look like deleting social media. Social media platforms like TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, platforms that over-sexualize everything. We live in a generation that just seems to over-sexualize anything. We can't even watch a simple TikTok without getting sexual immorality pushed into our face. Maybe that may look like if you're in a relationship and you're struggling to honor God, or if you're in a relationship 
that is not equally yoked and they're not pursuing God the same way that you are and are causing you to go against your convictions, maybe it's time to start cutting off the time that you spend with Bay and start focusing on spending time with Jesus. Or maybe just cut that relationship off in general if it is leading you away from God. Maybe it's the people who you consider friends. People who you consider friends that always seem to lead you away from your convictions. Who make you feel like it's okay this one time to fall into sin. Whatever the case may be, it all leads back to the question that Autumn had us ask ourselves last week. Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus Lord or is it social media? Is Jesus Lord or is it the relationship? Is Jesus Lord or is it money? Is Jesus Lord or is it sex? Is Jesus Lord or is it those friendships? Who is Jesus to you? And, a, and cutting these things off is easier said than done. Trust me, I know, I'm in the same position as you. I felt like a hypocrite writing this message because this, the Bible, the thing about the Bible is that the truth hurts and the Bible is oftentimes a mirror and it shines back to that ugly reflection of our sin. It's hard cutting these things off. And an additional question that I want us to ask ourselves tonight is what, if, is what I'm refusing to cut off worth compromising my relationship with Jesus? Is what I'm refusing to say no to get out of my life? Is what I'm refusing to cut off worth compromising my relationship with Jesus? Is a relationship worth it? Is a pleasure worth it? Are the friendships worth it? Well, what I've come to realize is that there is nothing that this earth has to offer that is worth compromising our relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. There's nothing that this world has to offer because people come and go. The high wears off. You sober up. The pleasure goes away. Relationships end. People fail to meet expectations on a continual basis. But Jesus is eternal, and there is nothing that compares to him. And Jesus warns his disciples the danger that they face if they don't cut these things off. It can lead them into spiritual death. That's the reality that we face if we don't say no to these things that are leading us into habitual sin. Another question, one more question that I want you guys to ask yourself and to really think about is how long will we hold on to the things that are killing us spiritually? How long are we holding on to the things that are killing us spiritually? For those who don't know me, um, before I gave my life to Jesus, I was a party animal. I used to always, you couldn't go to a party and not see Trey there. You know, I was always in the middle of the dance floor, even though I can't dance. I was always, you know, the one with the drinks, always the one with the weed, always the one that was the life of the party, essentially. That was me. And I had to start saying no to those things because it literally almost killed me. I was 19 in my dorm doing homework, 7 p.m. on a Friday, when a heart attack just came out of nowhere and landed me in the hospital for a week. It was at the beginning of finals. And I had to make a decision in that hospital bed. Am I going to just leave the hospital and keep doing the things that are literally leading me to death? Or is there gonna be time for change? And I still face that now, like, I don't know what is going on through my mind that is hooking me to these little electronic things they call vapes. But I have asthma. And vaping is something that, you know, after smoking weed, I wanted, you know, to turn to something. I end up turning to vape, vaping. And vaping has been something that is literally doing You know, luckily for my girlfriend, she's telling me, like, Trey, you need to, like, stop. And being, you know, in a position to where I had to say no to some things in order to see growth in my relationship with Jesus was very hard. This sermon hopefully is encouragement for you guys and not condemnation. Because we're no longer slaves to sin. But we have a living hope in Jesus Christ because he made us alive. When he took the death that me and you deserve... He took that from us. He died on a cross for our sins. And through help of the Holy Spirit, we can all be sanctified. We're all currently in a process of sanctification, which means being made holy through the help of the Holy Spirit. 
All we have to do is just reflect, recognize, and cut it off. Reflect, recognize, cut it off. I want y'all to say it with me. Okay, one, two, three. Reflect, recognize, cut it off. Amen? Okay, guys. So before we go into our next bit of discussion time, I just want to remind you guys that there is no mistake that you have made that can separate you from the love of God. A love so strong that he came down, died the death that we deserve, rose from the dead, and have given us a living hope that these habitual struggles that we go through will one day be a testimony for somebody else. Years down the line that may be sitting in the seat that you're sitting in right now, who may be discouraged by the sins that are holding them back. You went through that, and God can use our mess-ups as a testimony to help his younger sheep grow up in the faith. All we have to do is just keep heart, reflect, recognize, and cut it off. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go into our next bit of discussion, and then me and Autumn will come up and close us off for tonight. So if you will bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for each and every person who is in this room tonight. God, I'm just so thankful for how you continue to work through this ministry, this college ministry, not just this one, but all over Belton Temple and all over this country. God, I just ask that this message sticks to our hearts and on our minds and that we don't just hear the word, but we also enact it in our everyday lives. God, we just thank you for who you are, that our sins and our mistakes, God, you pay for that. And we're just so thankful for that, Jesus, because without you, there's no telling where we will all be. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be able to feed your sheep. And thank you for using me in this way. And I just ask that, you know, there's people who are in the crowd who you may be calling to use, God. So I just ask that they answer the call that you have for their lives and that you just be with each and every one. And it's in your name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so let's spend this time into our last bit of discussion questions and then me and Alan will be back.